<laughs> so, um, this is the way I'd like to tell you what I want to tell you. Uh, I want to spend some time with astronomers uh, motivating the, the, you know, what the problem is. And then I want to uh, then move from there to the observation that uh, extra dimensions can help. And it's because the uh, cosmological constant problem, in its essence, is the uh, convolution. The two things that should be different are the same. And that sameness has a hidden assumption in it, which is that we are in four dimensions. and extra dimensions break that link, and that's the uh, elbow room with which we hope to uh, make progress in the problem. I'll make it concrete in the six-dimensional version that we uh, that we have, which is trying to put all these things together. And we're not done, but I'll give you a, a prognosis on an example this specialist. Here we are, uh, the things that need to be still done, and uh, why we think it's going to, why we, why we haven't given up yet. That's where we're going. The main message is, is that naturalness is really an opportunity for this uh, dark energy, but if you're a cosmologist and you're trying to understand what the dark energy is, it's actually a little bit depressing because uh, there's, it's probably true, particularly with dimensions all go towards W equals minus 1, that purely within the framework of uh, ob observations in cosmology, we don't have enough information to determine amongst the various models that could be described in the dark energy. And, uh, that shouldn't be, the main message is that that shouldn't be too depressing because uh, there's an important clue that that ignores, and that is that any model of dark energy has to be embeddable into some reasonable microscopic physics. And the, the good news is that that's difficult to do. That's also the bad news, but the good news is that it's difficult to do. And it's, uh, the interesting thing is that the, the, the things on which the models uh, rely for phenomenological success typically are very difficult to obtain from microscopic theories that, are, uh, that make sense. And that's generically because what you require are very small scalar masses, very flat scalar potentials. And those are notoriously difficult to obtain from microscopic physics. And so uh, that's the opportunity. It's, it's, uh, it's the difficulty of getting the phenomenology to be embeddable in a reasonable way into what we know that makes work for sure we can do is what will make the thing theoretically constrained enough that the problem will be solvable. So uh, provided you can find something which that's probably the subclass of theories which you want to find the same exact way. Now, the, the main difficult is the naturalist story. And so let me back off the cosmological content and talk about the hierarchy problem. <coughs> Technical naturalist has been a guide for decades now in particle physics and trying to replace the standard model. And the logic for it is that the standard model has this beautiful property that given the particle content that it's the most 
general model we could have written down at low energy, which is a general normalizable model. And normalizability in modern designing is just the leading term in low energy expansion. And um, if it's a, if it, that makes you think that the, if you had some more mysterious physics at higher scales, and we know higher scales exist because we know the Planck scale exists and nothing else. If you integrate that physics out, and if the, that physics gave you as light, as light degrees of freedom, the ones that we know about in the standard model, then the most general thing you'd expect to see at low energy is the standard model, and it's a very robust understanding as to why the standard model is successful. So that uh, relies on it being generic. And so uh, if you look at the standard model in particular, it has a bunch of dimensional terms, but there's one term which is not dimensional, which is the one that sets the scale for the whole problem, sets the vector weak scale, it's a big mass term. And uh, the problem is that uh, if, if the standard model is an effective theory like this, you can write that theory down at any scale you like. If you've got a, if your fundamental theory is a swing theory, you can integrate out all the heavy modes and choose to regard it as an effective theory at any scale you like. And so if the weak scale is down here, we normally write the standard model down with the parameters chosen to be the ones that are uh, relevant to the scales that we do the measurement. But if you have some more fundamental theory at higher scales with lots of particles in between, the problem is that you could be writing the standard model down at any of those scales. And as you integrate out at a particle, say, whose mass is very high, then um, the contribution is that theory will have a, 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 a determinate and a big mass term. But it will also get contributions uh, that term will be contribution from the quantum fluctuations of these particles you're integrating out. And so the physics of the Higgs mass term is there in any scale you look at it, but the value you would have associated with that mass term at low energy in terms of the ones at higher energy is the sum of the, of the, of the direct value of higher energy plus the quantum contributions of all the particles you integrate out as you go through the threshold. Now the problem is that since these mass scales are so different, if you integrate out a particle whose mass is 10 to 11 GeV, you get something down here which is a uh, whose size of 100 GeV, you have to have a cancellation between these two, these two forms of 20 decibels. And then the problem gets worse and worse and worse the higher you go, depending on where you think the activity should. So this kind of cancellation of 20 decibels uh, just doesn't happen in other, other, other things we know. We, we, there's lots of hierarchies and small numbers known in physics. And every one of them, except for this one pretty much, has the property that uh, you, if you ask why is it small, the answer is there no matter what scale you chose to write the vector theory down. The way we understand that things like the, if you didn't have a natural solution to the hierarchy problem, you'd have to say that this small number arises at low energy because with a small higher scale, it wouldn't give you an enormous number here, but you'd have to just perfectly cancel all the particles that are going to get out between the fundamental scale and the scale that you're doing measurement of the large of the things that you're So there's been a number of things that were proposed to deal with that, and they all kind of essentially cut to the chase of the, of the, of the issue there. You need to think that the Higgs doesn't exist. There's a composite thing at higher energy, so there's no Higgs squared term to write down. You could think that there's a cancellation that's enforced by some symmetry, because the symmetry which makes the contributions cancel as you integrate things out. But that requires the symmetry not to be broken badly enough. Or you can think of these X dimensions, or, or X dimensions could be there, and what that essentially does is says that you were fooled into thinking that the Planck scale was really a large scale. It could be like the weak scale. The weak scale, the Fermi constant, the Planck scale is the number you get from the Fermi constant and the Newton constant. And so the analog of that for the weak interactions would have been 246 GeV. But that's actually bigger than the actual W boson, which is at 80 GeV, because of dimensionless factors, stuff like that. And so extra dimensions show or the existence proof that the physics of gravity could be at scales much smaller than the Planck scale because of dimensionless factors to do with the volume of uh, extra dimensions. So those three approaches all kind of address one aspect of the task of the problem. So uh, the problem for the cosmological constant is that there was another term there, which is even bigger. It's got four powers of mass in it. And so all those issues apply again. But it's worse, because the scale, the observational scale for mu is now 10 to minus 3 electron volts rather than something with the weak scale. And so all the arguments I gave you now apply that you integrate down to particles we already do understand, the W boson and the mu on and the electron. So the electron level, Contributions of electrons have to cancel what was there from all the higher particles to 32 decimal places to get to something as small as we need at the energies we need at the very low energy. And so that's a problem that's harder than the hierarchy problem because it's taking place at scales which we already thought we understood. And so the electron is the problem. You know, the, the various mechanisms that could address the hierarchy problem for the Higgs mass above the weak scale could also help with the cosmological constant problem above the scale because you're going to modify the spectrum of physics at those scales, and you have to really measure that spectrum anyway. The problem here is that you have to modify things with energies which you have access to experimentally, and so it's very strongly constrained. 
So just to underline that, you know, the, we know that the electron quantum fluctuations gravitate because we know that things fall, triple equivalent works to an accuracy of a part per ten to the thirteen. So binding energies of atoms are just taking in at the part of ten to the seven. So you're starting to see quantum fluctuations in the electron, which are gravitating. And we know that the binding energy is included in the energy of the atom, and the excessive equivalent principles say that it's really the total energy of the atom that counts for the binding energy. So this graph gravitates, but for some reason when you take the photons off, this graph doesn't gravitate because the zero point energy of the electron is pretty much gravity. If you're looking to modify the physics at scales that are very low, in a way, well, all you want to change is how the zero point energy is gravitating and nothing else because so much you simply understand electrons are well. Now of the things that have been examined for the hierarchy problems, uh, none of them in themselves solve the problem, but I think the proposal I'm going to try and tell you here is one that combines these two in a way which uh, is designed to modify physics with low energies and only change the gravitational response of the vacuum. And the main thing is that's even close to be possible, given the whole scale of the world. So how can extra dimensions help, in particular? <coughs> the cosmological constant problem in this essence boils down to uh, two things being the same. What are those two things? Well, the cosmological constant is this thing. It's the thing in Einstein is raising the that's the same thing if you put on the other side of the equation as a stress energy contribution to support the symmetric, which is what four dimensional length invariance would demand of, of, uh, of, of an energy density. So the problem is that in four dimensions, the length invariance of the vacuum essentially tells you that the vacuum energy is the same as the cosmological constant. And the problem is that we're measuring the cosmological constant to be small because we measure the curvature of four dimensions in space to be small. Whereas the vacuum energy we believe to be large, because that's the thing that's involved in zero point energy of the particles. Now, the four dimensions part is important. We only know that the rank invariance is a good approximation to the vacuum in four dimensions. In the next dimensional model, there are lots of examples where uh, you have four dimensionally the length invariance vacuum energy, or energy, the tension of a grain, uh, and that energy is localized in the x dimension. So it has to curve space, but it doesn't have to curve the space to the dimensions that you see. It can, it can curve the x dimension. And so examples like that. Uh, there are many cases where you can actually explicitly solve for the back reaction of energy sources by the brain in x dimensions. And one of them is in six dimensions, there are solutions where the x dimensions are spheres, and there are also solutions where you have uh, x dimensions where you can remove a wedge of the sphere along two lines of longitude, identify two sides, and acquire in that way conscious singularity, say, at the north and south pole. Those are describing the back reaction of uh, an object which is uh, two dimensions less than the six dimensions. Which would be a four dimensional world. Uh, and that, that is the existence proof that you can have four dimensional, the rent invariant energy, uh, and yet not uh, curve the four dimensions that you're living on. The thing I didn't tell you is that in these geometries, the intrinsic geometry of the four dimensional surfaces is flat. So you've broken the link between the large thing, the vacuum energy, which is rent invariant, and the small thing, which is the curvature of space that you see in cosmology. So the, now the question is can you run with that and really pin it down? Really uh, set up the problem, and set up the problem in a way where you can you can believe that you have a very small uh, curvature of four dimensions in a technically natural way. As long as it's stable and So, uh, so if you think of the scales involved, this is the Hubble scale. This is the, the scale that this which the vacuum energy is measured to be, and this is the weak scale. This strange scale is fine as far as normalization goes. The generic behavior of things in there. Is not a problem. The problem is the integrating out of things like the electron that are between the weak scale and the electron uh, uh, scale. The interesting observation that uh, Davis and Pia uh, and Nina made was that extra dimensions could actually kick in at this point. It's kind of an interesting point that the extra dimensions can be, can be that large, provided that you localize all the things of gravity onto a, a surface so you can only test these extra dimensions using uh, gravitational. Now what you have to do now is rethink, so in, in X dimensions, what's the natural tissue here? If I, I'm going to have to make some choices to have flat four dimensional surfaces that are living on a close to flat surfaces. And if I integrate up physics from the weak scale down towards the lower scale, I want to ask, you know, first I want to identify what the choices were, and then I want to ask, are they stable on the normalization? Um, now the nice thing about the large X dimensional picture is that the one thing you change is gravity. Not, none of the Electrodynamics, electrodynamics of electrons change because that's stuck on some brain. So it's doing kind of precisely what you're looking for. It's modifying the electron, but only the way the electron gravitates, not the way the electron interacts with the photon. And so you 
got some uh, potential for being able to pull off what you want looking at what you're trying to accomplish. So how do you make that concrete? Well, you need some sort of a specific formulation in which you can actually ask this organization question in a concrete way. And so I'm going to do that in the context of six dimensions of supersymmetry because those are things that seem to be ingredients that uh, make the scale well like to work. Extra dimensions kick in where you need them. Supersymmetry is there to help you with the uh, cancellation of the dimension. So uh, the proposal with which I want to examine the class bill, I, mean, what for the, I want to examine what the choices are that make the solution flat, and then I want to examine what are those choices stable and what are So the way I'm going to do that is within the specific context of six dimensional large X dimensions. And so the two things you're going to choose are that you've got X dimensions that are in an ADD kind of scenario, like the uh, 10 minus 2 micron whole scale, and the radius is you know, 2 microns. And we're going to ask that the physics be super symmetric in a way that will be more specific to the one second. So we're all living on brains. There's two X dimensions, and this size is kind of micron X size. The scale is involved, the, the gravity scale and the X dimension can be both 10 GeV, the physics line scale is 10 GeV, the dark energy scale. And that, those things are related in these kind of models by this formula that uh, we're going to use. Now, I'm going to ask that the bulk be super symmetric. Supersymmetry, here's, here's an example of it. This is more than one supersymmetry in, uh, in four dimensions of supergravity. And they all work for the purposes of the argument I'm trying to make here. I'm going to focus on this particular one, which is the chiral age supergravity. And in particular, it has a potential energy here for the scale of field 5, which is six dimensions of the other one, which I'm going to talk again, so I'm sorry to do it now. Um, notice there's no cosmological constant in this uh, six dimensional doctrine because in six dimensions, uh, there is no supersymmetry. That's part of the why you want supersymmetry. Uh, the scales of supersymmetry breaking in this picture would be on the brains, at least on our brains, supersymmetry has to be badly broken because if the TEV kind of scale is the scale of fundamental physics in six dimensions, we know that that's, we don't see two partners, so we'll ask the supersymmetry to be badly broken on the brains. And there'll be a trickle down effect where the bulk will also learn about supersymmetry breaking, the rest of the bulk is the stuff in next dimension. And so, but it'll only learn about it weekly because it's coupled, it's, it's, it's gravity and its friends under supersymmetry, and they're all coupling with the same strength, which is gravitational in that case. And so that means that the scale of supersymmetry breaking in the X dimension is the supersymmetry scale, which is the scale of the dark energy, and that's, that's also an effect. So the next spectrum is basically in the dangerous region where in higher dimensions there's lots and lots of loose fine modes involved, but on the brain, say it's the same model, the concrete one. So there's nothing special happening on the brain. You have at very low energies the massless graviton. There's typically a massless scalar at the classical level because one combination of the fixed dimensional graviton and the, the radius of the extra dimension is fixed by the classical equation of motion. There's a flux in the problem that's stabilized it. And there's another combination which is flat, and that's because there's a scaling branch to the super gravity equation. And you'll see that some of the properties that I'm going to talk about will be special. If you ask the brains that we're living on to respect that, uh, that scaling branch at the classical level, that will Helps with the starting point in the cosmology. So I, I kind of want to emphasize this flat direction because uh, one confusion is that this is not self tuning. If you took the system and you dinged it, it's not going to be that you're going to start with a flat solution and you're going to relax back to another flat solution. You have a flat direction. If you ding it, if you ding the system, that flat direction will start to roll. And so it's numerically you're going to have runaway kind of behaviors when you contribute. All right, so the, the main problem is, um, what are the choices that make this thing flat? So that means we have to explore the solutions for that supergravity, the cheapest ones that are there, and are there ones that are flat, and are there ones that are not flat? And then once we've identified them, we'll be subject to the solutions of those types. And then once we've done that, we want to know uh, what are the choices that the supergravity choices we made, and we say the ones that are normal. So in the first part of that, there's been some progress over the last few years. That's where most of the, the work has been on. And that is that there's a, that a lot of the solutions that are now being explored. I think what six dimensions is, it's complicated enough that you can uh, see some of the features of higher dimensions, but it's simple enough that you can actually explore the group things. And so, in six dimensions, the solutions to six dimensional supergravity are well explored. And uh, in particular, a lot is known now about the solutions that are supported in six dimensions by configurations having just a couple of brands. So, um, so, so here's the equation to solve it. These are the equations coming from that action I you before. Uh, I'm going to focus on this particular supergravity for a reason, and that's because there's a topological constraint in the whole problem, which says that the, um, the 
if you have a bunch of brain, I mean, tensions, and the end length is T, then the sum of those tensions uh, plus an integral over the curvature of the extra dimension is an integer. This is a topological thing telling relates to whether or not your extra dimension is spheres or chloride or whatever. The integer there is, is two if you have spherical solutions, and it's zero if it's colloidal solutions. And so, in particular, if you had been looking at the concentrations on porous, and that, those would be appropriate for models where there's no potential energy here. So those are the models I'm not looking at. Then this constraint would have said that the sum of the tension plus zero because the force is flat is zero because the order number of the force is zero. And so the sum of the tension would be zero on a topological graph. So you need, in particular, some negative points. That's something which looks like fine tuning. And uh, I can say more about that. Uh, uh, this is not fine tuning. This is a topological condition. If you, if you perturb the system, Right hand side is an integer, it can't change. Any continuous process, if you change the sum, what will happen is that the geometry will adjust to make this thing true because it's not going to be the But I would like to look at systems which all the tensions are positive. And so for that reason, I want to look at solutions where the topology of the extra tensions is a sphere. And for that reason, I want to have the curvature be non zero in the solution. And for that reason, I need to look at these super gravity where the extra tensions are positive. So that's why I'm looking at these figures. So now a lot of solutions are known. They typically, uh, the ones that are actually symmetric in extra dimensions are known in great generality. And they typically have singularities at, at up to two points. They could have, they could have no, there's one solution with no singularities which is found in the 80s. There's one, there's one solution with one singularity and there's some with two singularities. And those singularities interpreted being the presence of brains whose background can source in the geometry. The singularities are sometimes curvature singularities, sometimes not. Uh, typically, you will get a curvature singularity if you think of the brain that's sourcing them as being having an action like this plus higher derivative terms. So it's coupled to the metric and it's coupled to the scalar field, essentially, depending if this is the source function as a, as a, as a function of the, of the six dimensional scalar field. And the short version of the statement is that if there's a coupling to the dilaton here, then what happens is that the, that means that the, the dilaton field in the extra dimension likes to, uh, it becomes logarithmically singular close to the brain. And there's stress energy in that, so that pulls the curvature with it, so they get curvature similarity. If this thing is a constant, so it's a pure tension brain, then you don't source the, the six dimensional scale, and then the metric tension has conical similarity uh, near the brain, and I'll come back to why conical similarity is going to be interesting or not. But there are other solutions. If the, in the, the solution I described before, where there's a, a spherical uh, brain, a spherical extra dimension with wedges removed, the tension is going to be exactly the same on both ends because those are related to the defect angles where you cut the uh, piece of the sphere. But there are other solutions where you have uh, conical singularities of different types and different sizes of both ends. They tend to be warped in interesting ways. The important statement is that all of the solutions for which both singularities are conical are flat. So all the static solutions are flat. There are always time connect solutions which are flat like no one. But all the static ones are flat. There are also solutions where the the one end is conical and the other end has a curvature singularity, and those solutions tend to be maximally symmetric and considered like in four dimensions. So there exist solutions which are not flat. The generic, enough of these solutions are known that the, that the parameters available in the solution, uh, there are enough parameters to describe the dynamics of, of a, a generic pair of brains here. And so the, the generic situation is that if you take an arbitrary pair of brains, there's no time to solution at all, and it's a, you have a runaway geometry where the four dimensions either enclosed or one off the city. Uh, for some combinations of the brains, you can get static solutions or maximum symmetric solutions, and for some of those, they're flat. But in particular, all the ones with conical similarities are flat. And I'm, I will remind you that conical similarities correspond to uh, the absence of a couple of the silicon. And the reason that those are flat is actually not just to understand that's, that's the condition that the brain. Uh, coupling to the bulk field uh, preserves the scale invariance of the supergravity equations in bulk. So, are those choices? So, so there are choices that can make things flat, and one choice would be a different condition for flatness would be to have only conical singularities uh, where the brains are, which would correspond to an absence of coupling to the silicon on those brains. So, these are, gonna, are those choices stable? And I'm going to focus on that particular choice, the, the conical singularity choice, because that's the one that so here's this is the work in progress part, and so I'm going to go through the steps that uh, to, to tell you what the what we know so far, and uh, why we're still working on it. So the first step, as I said, I told you already, uh, when both brains have conical singularities, all the static uh, solutions are four dimensions flat. That's a good thing. 
Um, the absence of delta nine is what you need to have this kind of linearity, and that's the flat because there's a scaling branch that you have to look at the flat one at the top of the Now, now the things you now, now you're going to start integrating things out. You're going to integrate things out on the brain, and those things are not supersymmetric at all. Those are the dangerous ones. That's the left one, which is the original problem. And you're going to integrate things out on the fault in the bulk, which is the super gravity, which is on the one hand very supersymmetric, but on the other hand it's coupled to the brain, and so it's going to know the what you're integrating, and you have to worry about the uh, Breaking and polluting the, um, the section gives you some stuff on the top. And get with the scaling branch that makes the thing flat, it's going to be broken by the quantum sections, and you have to worry uh, how big those sections are. Now, the good news is that brain loops on their own are not a problem. Those are the most, most broken under the symmetry. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the thing that, that we can manage is that uh, the, the, the absence of a, of a couple of the bills on, on the brain, and so Loops on the brain in themselves can't grow up as a result of the organ already. And so that's the basic reason why the brain loops are not so dangerous in this kind of picture, in this particular kind of construction. The dangerous loops are going to be the ones which have the, the brain clock to the ball, because there are, are loops with supergravity uh, quantum fractions can generate couplings to the deltron uh, on the brain, and then those couplings can then be dangerous to the doctor action of the downstream supergravity. Now, the good news about the loops in the bulk is that uh, six, the bulk loops you're interested in, remember, in integrating out physics, which is at very high energy, at the weak scale in this case, which is an extremely short wavelength compared to the size of the exponential. And so the response to that is, is a local response. And it knows about the, the fact that the, there's a lot of supersymmetry in that, in, 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 in the full theory, in, in bulk. There's six dimensions worth of supersymmetry in bulk, rather than just four dimensions. So the supersymmetry is being broken by the downstream, but on scales that are much longer than the scales that we're doing now. And so there's a lot of protection <coughs> in, the, in the bulk from supersymmetry, more than you would have bargained for thinking about one supersymmetry in four dimensions. The dangerous loops are the ones that talk <coughs> to the bulk and to the, to, the, uh, to the brain. Those are the ones that are kind of localized to the skin around the brain, and they can generate things. And we're in the process of identifying what these are. The trick is you want to do this calculation in a not strictly even flat state because it turns out that the, um, the, the local response to the short wavelength that those being grayed out tend to be curvatures, uh, local things in the curvature. And the flat space tends to give you things the size that I'd like them to be to satisfy the top of the constant problem because all the curvatures are zero. You need to do the calculation of the curvature not zero to see the response to curvature. Because one of the questions you have to ask is did you get curvature in these exponentials in the response to the quantum expression? So the last piece of good news here is that the um, normally the cosmological constant problem is, uh, is is something which is not sufficient to solve, like one loop or two loops or some small number of loops. And that's actually not true in this case because uh, in this case, each loop in the bulk, and you need two loops in the bulk, costs the power of e to the deltron. That's the thing that's counting loops in the extra dimension. But the classical solution I told you stabilizes the deltron in terms of the size of the extra dimension in this way. They use the phi as one of our squares. So each loop costs you a factor of one of our squares. A successful answer to the lack of energy would be something like the order of one of our other four. So only a couple loops is sufficient to have this loop factor to be something that you can call what you like. So the issue is, uh, is uh, the remaining issue is at the one and two loop level. Uh, does the mixed loop uh, brain interaction, are they sufficiently protected by the symmetry to uh, be sufficiently small? And that's the step that we hope to be able to report on this year. So, um, how much time do I have? Uh, a little over five minutes. Okay, good. So, I, I, so, so what, what I want to do with the last five minutes is to um, briefly summarize. Uh, there's a whole bunch of worries that you have to worry about if you're talking about, talking about talking about. There's a list as long as around of things that you have to check. And I'm going to show up the, the last slide will be a whole bunch of uh, items. And if you have a question on them, I have slides on those, and I can go through them. I want to focus on one specific worry in this next five minutes. And I'll just very briefly mention the observational tests. Uh, and I want to mention the tests because any successful, not just this particular proposal, but any successful proposal which addresses the naturalist issue of the cosmological constant problem is necessarily going to be changing physics at the scale of the electron. And that is what makes it hard, but that's what makes it an opportunity. And there have to be other non-cosmological uh, ways of testing the proposal because you're modifying physics at the scale to which you had experimental access. And in, that's true in particular for this proposal. And so I want to briefly mention what some of them are because uh, 
that's the way that you'll know if it was right or wrong. Uh, as, as someone said the other day, if it's wrong, you'll forget about the clock, but if it's right, the reason you know it's right is not just because it's going to be a technical natural proof you're talking about quantum problem, it's because it's going to make predictions for the LHC, it's going to have predictions for test of the and so forth. This is eminently falsifiable observationally, provided, of course, for your short that's the detail if you really understand the natural issues of that study. So there are observational tests in the domain. So there's a bunch of things you worry about. The biggest one is the technical nationalist itself, the, the normalization of, and the kind of sketch to you where that's going. Um, the other one is another question that people worry about is why do I behave? I told them most of the solutions are time dependent, and that's, uh, that's often regarded as being a problem. But I want to uh, uh, elaborate that a little bit. And then these other things I can talk about from now. So what about the runaway behavior? Um, so the thing was, we, we know what solutions are for a lot of brains, and, and for most of them, there are no time uh, independent solutions. Even for the ones that you like, the ones, the ones, that, the ones that are flat uh, and conical, as soon as you use the quantum corrections, you generate a potential for the flat direction, and so there's going to be runaway here as well. The issue there is, uh, there are two issues there. One issue is, is uh, can that runaway look like the technology we see? And the short version of that is that it can, it needs to be, but it can. But if it does, it will only work um, if the initial conditions are chosen and invent the right way. So, so there's two things that have to be adjusted to get the technology to work. One thing is the parameters and the action. Those are the things I'm asking for stable and renovation. But given that choice, there's also this big choice of initial conditions to the universe. If you cut them off and you let them run, are they going to look like what we see? And the best case scenario in this picture, I think it's clear already, is that, the, is that most of the solutions, even if you get the action right, are not going to be what we look at the technology. So there will be an, an initial condition problem uh, in and so, for many people, that would be the point where you back away from the time model. I would argue the, the point of view that the um, that it's important to separate this initial condition problem from the cosmological quantum problem, which is the issue of stability for normalization, stability under normalization of the parameters in the action. That's because um, the initial condition problem is, is is much like the initial condition problem that Dave Bang already has, and we, we certainly believe that that's the right theory. Um, the, the essence of an initial conditions problem is that they, what they say is that the, that the, the initial conditions seem to be special to get the later universe to work. But the solution to that could be in a re-understanding of what happens in earlier times in the universe before this is the later epoch of technology where you're looking at initial conditions. In the Big Bang, inflation is the same as the solution. That, uh, it, can be, it can be true that you have dynamics in the past for which many, many kinds of initial conditions all approach what looks like a very funny set of initial conditions from the point of view of the Big Bang. And so the main me message there is that the resolution to that can be at scales to which you have not yet probed very carefully in the very early universe, although we are starting to probe the present. Um, and so the same thing could be true to these six dimensional scenarios. That uh, the issue of initial conditions may or may not be ameliorated by some earlier epoch, possibly by inflation. But that's a, a, a model building problem, which is not at the same level of difficulty as the cosmological quantum problem. And so if I can solve the cosmological quantum problem at the expense of this, I'm happy to do it. But that's something that's kind of So there is an initial condition issue there. What about observational tests? There is a number of them. The first statement is that uh, the cosmology that you get from this thing is not a cosmological quantum, although that depends a little bit on how the instruments are stabilized. Um, but the, the existence of a cosmology along these lines uh, needn't rely on stabilization. Roll down a potential along the otherwise flat direction uh, can give you potential energy domination and describe the dark energy in a quintessence way. And the basic thing is that this, 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 this light mode for this flat direction stays very light and it's light enough to be cosmologically active. And that raises all kinds of issues about scalar tensor theories and bound on scalar tensor theories and the phenomenology of that. Um, but the statement about cosmology, the simple statement would be that it's uh, time dependent, it's not a cosmological quantum, although that's not a the smoking gun test of this kind of a picture is the modification of gravity because the extra dimensions have to be, they're basically being set by the size of the cosmological constant and the absorbed dark energy energy. And you can't make them smaller, they're screwing them up. So that means that you have to see deviations from this law. And in the units that, uh, that the Adelberg or anything use, the, the test is, you have to see it in, in the 1 to 10 micron kind of range. Uh, and, the, and they're now at the 44 micron range. So they're, they're, they're closing in and they can be the thing that kills this definitively. Uh, 
turns out there, there are implications for collider physics, as you might imagine. Large next dimensions, which just have gravity in the next dimensions, have implications for collider physics because even though each fluid flying mode is gravitation coupled, there's so many of them that the cross section for producing missing energy in the next dimension is of the weak scale of six channel cross section. And that's true in phase here because there's more channels now in the next dimension. Uh, you might worry, you know, the aficionados might know that, that I told you 10 PEV is where I want these extra dimensions to be. And that's actually on the high side to see extra dimensions in the LSD. Typically, they would say you need to see six extra dimensions at the 2 PEV scale or lower. But I don't worry about that too much because it really, uh, one thing, this thing has scalar fields in the extra dimensions, and you can have a dimensional coupling between the scalar fields and extra dimensions and brain particles in the standard model. And so you're more sensitive than you otherwise would have been bargaining for based on gravity. It's also true that. Uh, the 10 PDB is a scale set by Newton's constant, whereas if this something is going to have to kick in there, because the string theory, there's typically a hierarchy. The Newton's constant scale is higher than the string scale, which is higher than the Newton's scale. And so if, there, if this is really what's going on, the first part of you see is unlikely to be as high as 10 PDB, so it's probably going to be lower. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that I think that the, you know, it's too early to abandon naturalism. Although it's worrisome that there's cosmological constant problem in the picture that's been required to deal with. But I think it's, it's, it's our, our one great white hope for being able to solve the dark energy problem because it, 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 it's expressing the fact that it's difficult to embed these scalar field theories into microscopic physics in a way which matches what we understand about how microscopic, microscopic physics should behave. And we don't want to give up that clue because that's probably what's going to be the thing that, together with the observation of technology, is going to make this problem solved. Extra dimensions helps in the sense that the, the basic problem is the convolution of, of uh, vacuum energy with curvature in four dimensions. And in four dimensions, those things are the same thing, but in higher dimensions, they're not. And so that's over when it to work. Uh, it may, it's not yet clear that the extra dimension proposal will be stable under normal relations to the degree you want, but I think it's not the questions that we find are uh, acceptable. There's certainly in these kind of models an initial condition issue. And uh, if that bothers you, then that's probably you to go out. But uh, it makes that, as I've argued, makes it like a hot big bang. There's an, an issue of earlier cosmology, which may or may not be used so. It's certainly predictive, and that's the best part, is that uh, you can falsify this picture, because uh, we're modifying scales at low energy so we can, so we have external actual So what's nice about this problem is that the problem is, is unlike most problems we have in particle physics, uh, it's at scale we have external actual and not so, with that, I'll thank you for your time, and this is the other slide that I can show you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the slide that we're using with Oh, that's the psychic one, by the So the, the, so the kind of issue is just that, the, you know, that there's this long-standing observation that, that the, if you have extra dimensions at large, you've got a scale of the problem that's supposed to be a lot like the machine map. Yeah. And can you make that work? And so, and, 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 your, and your intuition should be no, because when people look at this in the large extra dimensions, uh, the basic problem is that you get too much mixing between the, you have a lot of, the good news in this picture is that what you, what you the, the, in the large extra dimensions picture for neutrinos, what you're asking is that the neutrinos that are living in your brain are mixing with fermions which are simply weak with the mass of the ball. And so the inclusive fine scale is after the scale of the light. And you're hoping that by that mixing, you're going to get an acceptable mass of the most uh, active thing that you can see. And what makes those, what essentially kills those models is, uh, is two things. Um, is, is what I'm telling you now is the non precise thing. Is, uh, the first thing is that you tend to get mixing. The, 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 the zero <coughs> motion inclusive fine sector tends to mix too strongly with the motion of the brain. So you tend to get not only mixing the most. Uh, the experiments you like, but also you get some things in the general thing that you might be done. The second thing is uh, <coughs> we tend to have a lot of channels for next dimensions and supernovas and things like that because it sounds pretty good. Now the good news here is that the, 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 the model builder is, you, so you, you can push, you can, you can kind of try and make this work and it's, and it's not, I think it's still true that, that you're really pushing a lot of things that don't want to, it doesn't smell like it wants to work. So you can kind of work the primary space to make it work. And the main thing that makes a difference from the previous analysis is the good news is that you understand why these fermions are massive. They're first of all, they're there because the current is a graviton and they're massive because the current is a graviton. You understand why they would be massive in the first place because it's not a 
if you design it right, you can you can make them have less on less numbers in the chirality in the next dimension. So you can kind of protect yourself from the from the in terms of their bigger their renormalization of these masses, which uh, makes the naive one of our size of the size of the uh, naive. And so you can protect yourself from that because they're chirality um symmetries that you can you can work with. But that and then the third good thing is that uh, the, the, the analyses that people had done were naive in the sense that they, they ignored the fact that the presence of brains in, in the boundary tissue was fairly unresolved. And so, uh, in particular, the zero mode that was causing the problem often was projected outside the boundary tissue. So, so you, you have no freedom in trying to make these models work because you don't have a zero mode that is degenerate in the beginning of the boundary brain. But, and so, given that, you can kind of push things a little bit. But it is still true that you are hurting from the super mode and, and the basic problem. No, that's that's the tricky thing. So you could so you could better be because otherwise you think that it's not going like the technology would be. But the
condition which you have to satisfy. So how would you really, uh, you know?
Thank you.